Commodore Therax stared at the results of the last battle drill as his task forces started to return to their assigned positions after running a series of simulated combat actions and fleet maneuvers. He noted with approval that the overall reaction times improved by 5% while the combat targeting rating went up by 7%. Not bad for naval reserve units, but we can do better, he thought to himself as he started tapping orders for another battle drill to be loaded into the simulator for the next shift change. As he looked at the hollow screen in the center of the bridge that showed the fleet returning to their standard formations, he thought back to four solar months ago when a livid envoy returned from Eliani space and started demanding that the fleet launch an attack on the Eliani homeworld to punish them for defying the orders of an envoy, failure to remit taxes, and allowing a foreign power to establish a military presence. The envoy used his considerable influence and family connections to try to goad the government into action, which was almost successful until news of the Zengshin Rebellion reached the leadership and shook the Commonwealth government to its core. Never before had a member rebelled or raised arms against the Commonwealth since it was founded and the Parliament reacted with rage. The Eliani issue fell to the background as the Zengshin action raised alarms throughout the government and the Admiralty, with calls for a punitive expedition to teach a lesson to the troublesome Zengshin taking priority. A secret directive from the top levels of the government called for the immediate suppression of the revolt to discourage any of the surviving members from trying to break away. The Commonwealth could not afford to lose the Nenchite deposits in the Zengshin system, as they were a critical component of null space drives, and the Zengshin deposits accounted for more than 60% of the refining output of the Commonwealth. The seizure by the Zengshin of over 50 Commonwealth warships was also an insult that demanded immediate action. Therax was secretly relieved that the Zengshin rebellion happened, and he got the distinct impression that the Admiralty shared in his relief when the scans from the envoy ship and its escorts revealed the full extent of the Republic fortifications of the Eliani system, and showed hundreds of Republic warships patrolling the system. Therax marveled at the scans when they were circulated among the Admiralty, and he had to admit to himself that he was shocked when he saw the five massive shipyards and the numerous forts and planetary defensive networks under construction that would rival those of the Core Worlds. He had taken an interest in humans when they were first encountered, and had studied their history and society as they expanded and rapidly achieved middle power status. Like his people the Nikuli, they were a warrior race with a long history of warfare and martial prowess. And the similarities between the humans and the Nakuli was the reason why they were one of the few races to vote yes to allow them entry into the Commonwealth before it was vetoed by the majority. The Republic showed its honor when they offered to help the Commonwealth fight the insectoids even after being rejected for membership, and Therax and many other Nikuli in the Admiralty derided the government's short-sightedness for spurning the humans' offer of alliance even while the insectoids were rampaging through Commonwealth space. Therax also remembered the silence that pervaded the large conference room as the recordings of the spy drone that followed the insectoid fleet to the Eliani system showed the battle. They watched as the same insectoid fleet that decimated the Commonwealth and destroyed half of the Navy met its demise at the hands of a Republic fleet that fought with a skill and tenacity that far outclassed the abilities of the Commonwealth Navy. When the recording was done, there was an outbreak of recriminations and disbelief as government officials, military advisors, and fleet officers tried to come to terms with what they had just witnessed. All he remembered thinking while this was going on was how much of a mistake the Commonwealth made by not granting entry to the humans. As he looked back to the hollow screen and saw his task forces finish slipping into formation, he wished once more that his orders had fallen on someone else to execute. He did not wish to fight the Zengshin, and though he relished a chance to do battle with them, he also understood why they rebelled. Sighing, he turned to his underling and ordered that the fleet flash to the next waypoint 1.5 parsecs from the Zengshin homeworld. Once there, he will run another series of battle drills before entering the Zengshin system and reclaiming it for the Commonwealth. The next solar day, as he was finishing up his daily exercise regimen, the alert chimes started wailing as the bridge ordered the crew to battle stations. He ran out of his quarters still in his exercise robe and was on the bridge a few seconds later, 
taking in the information on the hollow screen as it populated the display with sensor information. There were 120 Republic warships and 15 individual task forces comprised of eight ships each. They had flashed out of null space and surrounded his fleet, covering every axis of attack and effectively denying him the ability to maneuver. As he sat down in his chair and queried the battle computer for options, the communications officer yelled out, Commodore, we are receiving a transmission from the Republic ships. Therax nodded and signaled to open the channel. A few seconds later, an emotionless voice came over the channel. Greetings, this is Command Unit 1503. You are in violation of the Territorial Accords of 2173 and the Treaty of Eliania. This Treaty of Alliance requires the Republic to defend Zengshin territory. You have one solar minute to comply with our orders or offensive actions will commence. You will disarm all weapon systems and initiate core shutdown protocols. Failure to comply will result in combat operations. Thank you for your cooperation. Therak stared at the hollow screen as the countdown started and lost a few precious seconds as he came to the terms with the fact that the Zengshin had made a treaty of alliance with the Republic. He ordered the channel back open and started speaking. This is Commodore Therax of the Second Commonwealth Fleet. We do not recognize your claims to this area of space, and you will withdraw or face the consequences of violating Commonwealth territory. He indicated the channel to be closed and ordered all weapons charged as he toggled the battle computer to issue the defensive plan he chose from the list of options to all ships. His hands were shaking as he hit the controls and the realization that he was about to engage the Republic in combat threatened to overwhelm him. As the countdown passed 30 seconds, he looked at the scan results in confusion as the Republic ships seemed to shift in and out of space and the targeting scanners repeatedly failed to achieve solid locks. He felt a wave of dread as he suddenly remembered seeing these ships engage the insectoid fleet from the spy drone recordings and the destructive power they employed as they decimated the hive formations. As the countdown passed ten seconds, he started frantically issuing orders for an emergency flash-out, even as he knew that most ships didn't have enough time to fill the capacitors. The countdown hit zero and half of the Republic task forces accelerated with a sudden burst of speed that broke what few tenuous targeting locks his scanners managed to make, while the rest of the Republic ships flashed into null space, only to emerge two seconds later within his battle lines already firing their weapons. The ships that flashed into his formation were heading out towards the outskirts, while the ships that did not flash out hit the outer edges of his formations, and they joined in the middle as they passed each other marking their passage with dozens of broken and severely damaged Commonwealth ships. Therax watched as all the Republic ships flashed out and returned two seconds later. The task force is now broken down into individual formations of groups of four that went after his most powerful ships, swarming around them as they took down his most powerful warships with ease. His ships started receiving fire and he watched as his escorts tried in vain to intercept and break up the attack on his ship as they fell to defensive fire from the demon ships as they continued to blast through his hull and slice his battleship to pieces. A core overload warning flashed on the hollow screen, and he ordered all hands to abandon ship as he helped to carry the wounded and dead bridge crew to the life pods. While he waited for the last of the surviving crew to eject before stepping into his life pod, he looked at the holo screen as it flickered. It was a scene of carnage, as more than 75% of his 300-strong fleet was listed as destroyed or combat ineffective, and the battle space was littered with explosions as thousands of life pods drifted among their dying ships. The surviving remnants of his fleet that still had functional flash drives flashed out into null space while the ones that could not flash out started broadcasting surrender and powered down their weapons and scrammed their cores. He saw that the rest of the crew had ejected and stepped into his life pod, looking one more time at the hollow screen and finding the battle time displayed on the bottom right corner. Elapsed battle time, 16 minutes and 31 seconds. Next to that was an infographic displaying the number of enemy ships destroyed. He stared in shock as it boldly displayed the enemy losses. Six confirmed destroyed, twenty-one confirmed damaged. He took a shuddering breath and looked away. We never had a chance, he thought to himself as he keyed the door shut. He slammed on the eject button and grimaced as the G-forces threatened to make him black out 
as the life pod blasted him away from his dying ship and continued accelerating to get him out of the blast radius of the imminent core overload. A few minutes later, he used the positional thrusters to turn his life pod to face his battleship and watched as it died in a mini supernova, tears streaming down his face. The Republic ships had stopped firing as soon as they received broadcasts of surrender from the surviving ships and had retreated to station, keeping positions 100,000 kilometers from the battle space. They maintained target locks on the remaining Commonwealth ships as the emotionless voice repeated the same message every 30 seconds. Thank you for ceasing hostilities. Republic search and rescue ships are on their way and will be here momentarily. Please remain calm and activate your transponders to assist in your rescue. As Therax continued drifting in his life pod, he bowed his head and whispered a prayer to the spirit of his ancestors. He asked that they lead the souls of the dead who died in honorable battle across the river and into the afterlife. As he activated his transponder, he saw null space exit flashes and Republic ships entered the battle space and rescue shuttles started streaming out from their bays. The Republic vessels started locking tractor beams on the surviving Commonwealth ships and towing them out, while the rescue shuttles shot out tethers that grabbed life pods and started reeling them into the shuttle bays. He felt a jerk as his life pod was tethered and watched as it was reeled towards a brightly lit shuttle bay. He bowed his head and whispered another prayer, asking the spirit of his ancestors to help him avenge the deaths of those who died under his command. As he drew closer to the shuttle bay, his thoughts turned to getting vengeance against those that were responsible for the destruction of more than half the Commonwealth fleet and over 350,000 sailors, the Commonwealth government, 